he was, um, you know, over shutdown. So in passing, you know, she would tell me about different uh, people that she would follow. And, you know, everybody was just at home. We, I mean, we weren't doing, we had no other choice but to turn to social media. So when this all came about on February 16th, she kind of reminded me of who this guy was. Um, but I re would remember um, she had talked about the pattern um, that this one of the people that she was following would would do right, and the pattern was being disrespectful to black women. Um, was being um, he, it, there was information about him being scam a scammer. Um, if any customer, if anybody opposed him, he would block them. Well, first he would ridicule, he would talk down to them, and then he would block them. Right. So when this came about, light bulb popped in my head. I'm like, okay, well this is the guy. Um, but again, um, I had no clue of who he was, what he was, what he does. I mean, I'm not even in this space, right? I mean, this was, um, when I got involved in this thing, I mean, I hadn't sent a tweet in five years, right? So when all of this occurred, when he had doxxed us, um, I went ahead and I actually was, <laughs> Daniel, to tell you, um, I was, like kind of irritated. I was like really irritated about it. I'm like, why are we even in this space? Like what happened? You know, why are my children on the internet? Um, why is this guy coming at us? So I told her, I said, you know what? Shut, we're going to shut our social media down. Uh, let's go dark for a minute. Um, but again, you know, he was going live. He was just ridiculing. He was ridiculing us. He was talking about, I got her kids. I got her kids information tell Don Vaughn I said hello blah 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 I mean he was literally just like just verbally like assaulting us over the internet and I'm boasting like, that he figured out who I was yeah and boasting that he figured out who who she was so I'd say about you know 1 32 o'clock that morning rolling I was hot man I mean I was hot I'm like you know I'm like <laughs> I can't, I got too much to lose. You know, I got a household, I got family, I got people that depend on me to, you know, you know, people that work for me. You know, I can't go, I can't, I can't lose it, right? Um, but that was your first instinct. I don't know if you have children or anybody that's, that's watching um, that have children. You, you know, all bets are off when children are involved, young children. And so I had to master um, extreme emotion um, because I needed to go back to, I wanted to go back to my old Detroit roots, but I couldn't. So about one thirty, two o'clock in the morning, I sent my first tweet that I had, that I hadn't sent. I hadn't, cause I'm not a, a I don't tweet, you know, I, I mean, I had a Twitter account, but I hadn't sent any tweets for five, six years. So I sent a tweet and I says, and I posted a picture of us and I says, you know, Darius, this is Don Von Holland, husband of Danielle. Um, you posted my family. You posted me. Um, I need to understand why you did this. Please give me a call. So I'm like, you know what? If this guy, I'm, I'm going to get ahead of this guy, you know, because I know he's used to um, posting telephone numbers. He's used to posting personal things. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to dox myself. So I says, I need you to give me a call. I put my telephone, my personal cell phone number out there. It's 313 Three three zero four nine nine two. I need for you to call me. So, and I think I sent a couple other tweets after that. Um, and then the next morning, um, we got up, we we're moving around. We we're still hot, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do about this. And I believe that uh, Danielle had saw that he was live. And this guy had actually was telling his followers that, yeah, I talked to her husband I had a conversation with him, told her, told him what her, what his wife was doing and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, this guy is this, like, this guy is something's up with this guy. So I did another video and I says, you know, um, Darius, you said that we had a conversation. You have yeah, an they, But what to rewind yeah. before that, actually, I remember I shut my Twitter down. A yeah, yeah, yeah. Hours we, yeah, before, yeah, yeah, yeah. The night before, because I was receiving, you know, 
crazy, crazy tweets messages and messages for- and stuff. So I shut my Twitter down for about five, six hours, and we wake up to the morning. What Don just said um, happened afterwards, but the first thing we saw in the morning was someone sent us an Instagram post from him saying, oh, yeah, that's, right. that's how you clear a, a B-I-T-C-H. out. Yeah. So he thought his attempt was to basically, he wanted to threaten me. He wanted to shut me up. He wanted to scare me. He wanted to send me into a dark hole somewhere. And he thought he successfully had did that. So right. he boastfully made a post, you know, smiling and saying, that's how you clear a B-I-T-C-H out. Right. So um, now we fast forward. And then that's when the Instagram live, he was on Instagram live. And then... He stated what he stated in regards to actually having a conversation with me. So I did a video. I tweeted my second or third tweet. And I says, you know, um, Darius, you stated that you had a conversation with me. Um, You stated that um, um, that we talked. And I says, you know what? (laughs) My phone has been ringing, but it hasn't been you. I says, you have an extreme vivid imagination. I mean, this man actually imagine an entire conversation and he actually verbatimly read that conversation off to his followers. Well, he didn't imagine. He lied. That's yeah, he lied. Right. That's so, what so, so, so the two of you never had a conversation, but, he put, out, conversation. but he put it out there uh, um, um, uh, that he did. Have, you, right. have the two of you taken any action, any civil action? Have you taken anything asking to have him take things down? Uh, has there been any action have you taken against him? Yes. Um, as far as taking, I mean, I've, I've, I've gotten, um, I've went the route of, you know, with, I'm, I'm, with people that I know and, and, and or whatnot, where resources that I've been trying to use, um, we've, 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 we've filed a local police report. Um, it is currently in the prosecutor's office. Um, I'm in the discussions with the prosecutor right now on a local level here in Michigan. Got it. Um, we've also had conversations um, with some folks with, in the DOJ, and it's funny that I didn't understand that this actually uh, falls in the guidelines of Homeland Security in this matter, and um, we reached out to the FBI, and naturally um, we followed the process of where you report things on Twitter, you report things on Instagram, you report things on Facebook. However, um, that has not worked because our, my children's pictures are still, are still li- there, on yeah. his Twitter. And he refuses yeah. to delete them. And he refuses, refuses to delete them. So, and this is why, um, you know, I, I, got, I really kind of got into this battle. Number one, I got into battle because of my children and my family, my wife. And then number two, as I started getting into the fat meat of this whole situation, um, there's really no real process um, that's in place on the local police department level because there was someone else that was here in Michigan that had a situ- certain situation with him, and they had went and tried to file a police report, but the Detroit Police Department kind of just threw it out, said, you know what, this, you don't have a case. However, um, in, the, in the zip code that we live in, they are kind of like really diligent on trying to push it through. I mean, and that's the thing. I started getting into the fat meat of this. It's like, what is the real process to report somebody on a local level? Where can people go instead of like reporting it, cyberbullying on, you know, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter? Like, what is the actual process that's in place? Which really, um, it's it's almost like is zip code specific, you know? Right. Yeah. So, so that's the so, so that so again so your complaint is still uh, in the hands of the DA's office. Yes, no decision, exactly. And no decision has uh, has actually been made uh, on that. Have uh, last Correct. question for y'all. Have y'all heard from other people uh, who have been uh, who have similar complaints uh, with regards to Darius Cooks Williams? Absolutely. I mean, we get we get flooded with inboxes of of people that have had situations uh, in dealing with him. As a matter of fact. Um, uh, there are people that have been coming um, specifically in my inbox stating that um, they were afraid to come out um, because of what he does. I mean, they don't really have any, you know, I'm not going to say they don't have to fight in them. They just necessarily don't know what to do to try to fight this whole problem process. So that's the thing. Um, I'm, I'm actually trying to figure out how I can help them and what do we need to do. So it's like I'm kind of guiding the, the individuals. Right. 
that's in my inbox on what they need to do and follow the steps and the protocols that we are trying to do, you know, that we're doing. So, yeah, we got we get tons of people that reach out to us saying, hey, this happened to me. Hey, this guy blocked me. Hey, this guy owes me money. Hey, what do I need to do? You know, and that's the thing. It's like, man, I cannot really. It's like I got into the fat meat of this. And it's like, man, this guy is yeah. like a predator. And he's currently on his best behavior, trying to issue refunds and do customer service on live because of the heat that's been under him recently as far as, you know, your show and um, the hashtag Darius Crooks on Twitter, as well as Randy Travis's Fox 5 Atlanta two-part segment. Mm -hmm. And so, whereas people would normally get blocked or ignored when they're asking about a refund or products not received, he is on social media refunding mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and answering any inquiries, yeah. whereas that's not his normal stance. Right. So. And, and I want to, I want to, I want to touch, touch this point back again, because his stance on his reasoning for going after Danielle was because she harassed me for nine months. Roland, you know, as well as I do that, the definition of harassment and the definition of awareness is totally two different things, right? Daniel was literally spreading awareness to other women, right, about his hypocrisy. This guy is a predator to our aunts. This guy is a predator to our mothers, our grandmothers, our sisters, you know, and that's the thing. And again, she had to do it in strict anonymity because right. of the way he operates, yeah, I think in, in the week that I was doxxed, I was, I believe, the fourth woman that he doxxed. Or or fourth, I shouldn't say woman, because one of, it was a couple, the people that owned the uh, Airbnb in Texas, he doxxed them. Um, he doxxed myself. He doxxed uh, a young lady who um, did a chargeback regarding one of his Dining with Darius events. He put her private information out there as well as her brother's. And he put a young lady who he hired to do the cleaning services after one of his dinners, who he hired, I believe, off of Craigslist. He put her uh, private information out there as well. So within a week's time, I was like the fifth person that he doxed. Yeah. Well, um, this is uh, certainly disturbing. I've, I've invited him several times to come on the show to uh, discuss uh, these allegations, still waiting for him to accept that invitation. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know about this uh, court hearing from May 17th with Melanie's Ford mm -hmm. uh, regarding that restraining order. So we'll be uh, covered and see what happens as well. We surely appreciate both of you joining us. Yes, Thank sir. You. Thank you. Sir. All right. Thank you Thanks for a bunch and good luck with it. Folks, uh, coming up next, we're going to talk about the new Florida maps. They are just simply gutting black people trying to get rid of two majority black districts. We'll talk with Cliff Albright, co-founder of Black Voters Matter, about what is happening in the Sunshine State. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach. And on the next Get Wealthy, you'll meet Jandy Turner, who took her love of sports, expanded her network, and created a thriving business. I settled on developing a golf event planning business, which in and of itself has been very uh, viable for me. One of the things that I've learned from producing hundreds, if not thousands of golf tournaments is that business gets done on the golf course. All on The Next Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. This week on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Reparations, is it finally time? Two of the country's foremost authorities on the subject will join me to try to answer that very question. A powerful installment of The Black Table with me, Greg Carr, right here, only on the Black Star Network. Before Till's murder, we saw struggle for civil rights as something grown-ups did. I feel that the generations before us have offered a, a lot of instruction. Organizing is really one of the only things that gives me the sanity and makes me feel purposeful. When Emmett Till was murdered, yeah. that's what attracted our attention.
Hey, I'm Arnaz Jake. Black TV does matter, dang it. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. Stay woke. Republicans have been attacking Democrats all across the country, especially black people. Florida, they chose to take the racism to a whole to a whole new level. Governor Ron DeSantis rejected uh, the maps that the legislator uh, drew up. So he said, you know, I'm going to drop my own, getting rid of two majority black districts already. Uh, lawsuits have been filed against uh, Florida as a result of this decision. Joining us right now, folks, is Cliff Albright. He is the uh, co-founder of Black Voters Matter. Glad to have him with us. Uh, Cliff, um, look, we expect stupid stuff to happen in Florida. Now we see this. Uh, this is an, an absolute attempt uh, by Governor Ron DeSantis to completely uh, destroy black representation in Congress. So that yeah. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right, Roland. By the way, happy belated anniversary. Appreciate it. Um, no, I mean, we, we, we're we looking at, this is even worse than what we saw out of the recent uh, situations in Alabama with their maps and, and Louisiana with, with their maps and those situations. Uh, you know, the fight was really about whether or not the maps would be changed to give black folks the extra representation that we should have. In this situation, DeSantis, as you already noted, uh, has gone out of his way. In fact, arguing with the, his own Republicans within his state, uh, arguing to, to not just to not increase black representation, but to take away two seats, including carving up the, the seat that's in, in northern Florida, which, which goes from roughly from Jacksonville over to, to Tallahassee, which includes some, some rural black populations in between, but literally carving up that one district into four separate districts, none of which would have the ability to elect a, a black representative, taking it from a, a district that has you know close to 50 percent black representation and carving it up into four districts, none of which have anything more than the 30 percent, and some as low as in, in the teens. And so, you know, he's he's been very clear about what it is that he was trying to do. In fact, you know, idiotically clear, because he's basically announced that the reason that he was doing this is because he's trying to carve up this black district. Just a, a clear violation, not, not just of the Voting Rights Act, but more importantly, even of Florida law, um, and a Florida amendment that was passed regarding fair districts back in, in 2010, an amendment that was passed because of what the voters voted for in the state of Florida. So this is an attack on democracy writ large, but obviously on black folks. This is squarely rooted in racism and anti-blackness, and he's not even trying to hide it. And, and look, the reality is, whether it's this decision, whether it's uh, him leading the removal of Disney's uh, uh, favorite tax status, uh, we can go down the line. Ron DeSantis is trying to be Donald Trump 2.0. Uh, he's up for re-election as governor, but he also wants to be run. For, he wants to be the Republican nominee for president in 2024. That's what all of these moves are about. And in fact, I dare say that Ron DeSantis, and I said this about Mike Pence, is even more than Donald Trump. We more dangerous than Donald Trump. We knew Donald Trump was a buffoon, uh, but. What th these folks are even more dangerous than that idiot. <clears throat> yeah, no, definitely. And, and he's demonstrated in a variety of ways. And, and you just mentioned, you know, some of the things. And that's why I always say, you know, people try to act like voter suppression is just, um, you know, just a, a, an administrative um, act. It's, a, it's just a, a, a white collar crime. Right. It's a bureaucratic crime. No, voter suppression is a violent crime. It is violent impacts on our lives. And when you have somebody like DeSantis who's in power because of voter suppression and is able to do things like don't say gay and attacking LGBT rights and attacking black rights and, and literally killing people in the state of Florida because of the way that he's handled or mishandled COVID uh, and, and a protest bill, which has literally allowed people to drive cars over protesters. Let's not forget that voter suppression is a violent crime. It is having violent impacts on our lives, and he's using any means necessary to maintain to maintain that. Keep in mind that that, and, and shout out to the Florida legislators who, in the midst of this vote on this map, 
decided to do a sit-in, uh, and not even just a sit-in, a full-out protest, because they weren't just sitting quietly. They were they had signs and were, were walking around, and so shout out to them. But keep in mind what, what they did, what the, the Republicans did in response to that. They cut off the Internet, right, which is something that you see in, in these these countries that, you know, people try to, to, to paint at as being so authoritarian, dictatorships and all that. They cut off the Internet. Uh, and and um, and then they kicked out the journalists, right? Which again is something that you see in all these authoritarian states. This is what it's come to in the, in the state of Florida. All of it is rooted in anti-blackness. But as we often see with racism, structural racism, and white supremacy, what starts off um, geared directly at us eventually in, infects their entire system. Again, the 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 constitutional amendment that he is going against in in Florida law is an amendment that was passed by the voters of Florida. And so he is going against, he's attacking black voters and, and the black community, but in doing so, he is attacking the very nature of Florida democracy and something that Florida voters across the board had voted to approve. Well, I mean, this, these are the games that Republicans are playing, and um, this is also why uh, many folks have been making it clear that Democrats have got to wake the hell up, pay attention to what's going on, uh, you look at the polling numbers of President Joe Biden, they're down. Uh, they are not as low as Donald Trump's were at this particular point. Uh, and so Democrats are going to have to muster uh, something uh, uh, to say to voters, especially black voters. Otherwise, otherwise they're going to get obliterated in November, and they very well could take control of the House and the Senate. And if that happens, you're going to see all sorts of federal investigations. Uh, uh, you may see Republicans attempt to impeach uh, President Joe Biden. You're not going to see uh, the black judges that Biden has been appointing get confirmed by the United States Senate. They are going to declare war on black people and America if they are in control of the House and Senate come January 2023. That's right. And, and the only way to keep that from happening, one of the only ways to keep that from happening, and you mentioned it, Roland, Democrats have got to get, including in Congress as well as in the White House, Democrats have got to be just as ruthless about using their power. And yes, I said ruthless. They've got to be just as ruthless about using their power um, for the good, right, um, as, as folks like DeSantis have been for using it for the bad in the name of white supremacy and racism and anti-LGBT and anti-women and, and anti-everybody else, right? That's, that's, their, that's their campaign model, right? Republican Party, we hate everybody. And so, but they don't hate anybody more than black folks. So we need the Democratic candidates, those who are already in office, as well as those that are running for office, to, to be just as clear about their defense about black folks and other marginalized groups and to speak to our issues and to speak so unapologetically that's how you that's how you mobilize a base president biden has got to be just as aggressive at using his power and to, to protect students and, and to waive student loan debt and, and to deal with you know police violence and whatever it is that they can do at the executive level he's got to be just as as, as aggressive at doing that as people like DeSantis are for using their power for the bad. That is the only way. We're not, we don't count it. We're not going to say that you counter hate with hate, right? But you got to counter power with power. And you got to counter it with righteous power that is rooted in love and is responsive to your base the same way DeSantis, as you said, this entire move, it's, he achieves two things. One, he gets to achieve his anti-black fantasies. And two, he gets to establish himself as, as, uh, as somebody who's Trumpier than Trump and as somebody who can, can even stand up to, to Republicans within his own party, the Democrats have got to find that kind of courage and be willing to use their power in the same ways. And the campaign, in a way, that speaks towards that, not to campaign in a way that's speaking towards these, these, these unicorns that they think are out there that are going to somehow be um, um, converted to, to voting for, much the way that one of the, the, the Democratic candidates in Florida, we're not going to go into that, Stepped on, you know, uh, and stepped on her own toes and, and made some mistakes because she was trying to cater to some Trump voters. That's not a winning strategy. All right, then. Cliff Albright, always a pleasure, man. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, folks, going to bring in my panel now. Glad to have them here. Let's uh, start off with uh, Michael M. Hotep, host of the African History Network, Kelly Bethea, communication strategist, Matt Manning, civil rights attorney. Let's get right into it. Uh, uh, Michael, I'll start with you. Uh, it, it, is, it is crazy, I mean, just to literally watch what is going on. What, what Ron DeSantis is doing in Florida, I mean, he is really a mini Donald Trump. 
this man is a menace to society. Um, and, 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 and you would think that Democrats are coming up with a consistent and coherent, coherent message to take this man down, but they're flailing in Florida. They have no leadership whatsoever. Yeah, you know, Roland, um, back in 2018, when Andrew Gillum was running for governor of Florida against Ron DeSantis, and they had the debate, and Andrew Gillum said, I'm not calling Mr. DeSantis a racist. I'm saying the racists believe Mr. DeSantis is a racist. And I was telling people on my show who are in Florida, we have to stop Ron DeSantis. And people were telling me, oh, Andrew Gillum doesn't have a black agenda. They were saying they weren't going to vote because Andrew Gillum doesn't have a black agenda. I said, uh, Ron DeSantis has a black agenda. He has an anti-black agenda. And an anti-black agenda is worse than not having a black agenda. So, yes, there needs to be better leadership uh, from Democrats fighting, crafting the message, fighting against this. But also, when it comes to African Americans, we have to have something, an internal white supremacist detector that goes off and tells us, teaches us how to identify these threats. Because we could see this coming. And, De and DeSantis wants to run for president. And you, you look at the congressional maps. You look at the uh, stop the, uh, the, uh, the anti-woke bill. You look at don't say gay bill, all, all this nonsense. Um, and at some point, I think we're going to come to the realization that we're going to have to uh, leverage our economics to enforce our politics and target some of these corporations who help finance DeSantis and other Republicans and have nationwide economic boycotts against them. I know the boycotts have to be planned, but if we started planning them back in July of 2021 or something like that, or even, you know, we'd be ready to launch them right now. But we're going to have to, as Dr. King said, April 3rd, 1968, we're going to have to redistribute the pain through targeted, sustained economic withdrawal strategies. That well, 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 Matt, what we are seeing, we, we are seeing on the Democratic side a successful legal strategy. Uh, they have been racking up wins all across the country. Uh, th the problem is that's preventing a lot of these maps from going into place. That's trying to stop these voter suppression bills. But you still have to excite voters as to why they should keep you in charge. You absolutely do. And you have to, as Brother Cliff said earlier, you have to really explain the import of why these attacks on voting are so important. The average voter may not understand it, but as we talk about on this show every week, uh, every level of government is important and every level of government is being attacked and leveraged by Republicans right now. So I think you're right in that the, the Democrats have to not only continue that push um, with legislation or rather with the litigation, excuse me, but they also have to make sure that people understand. I think what he said was so brilliant that this is a violent crime. When when voter suppression occurs, it affects every aspect of our life, and it generally affects us in particular. And, for example, people may not know, but in the city of Miami, the exact same fight is going on right now with a black enclave called Coconut Grove, where the city of Miami is trying to dilute their voting potential right there in, in Miami. So uh, Democrats need to continue leveraging this point, and they need to continue educating on this point so people understand just how important it is to fight against this voter suppression. But, Kelly, the thing here is you also have to del deliver. And the, the major bills, the two major bills that African Americans are interested in, the George Floyd Justice Act, as well as the uh, For the People Act, and John Lewis Act, those three bills, weren't passed. And so it's hard to say, oh, this is what we did. If you're not actually making it a strong narrative, that's the most, that's the piece right there. You have to be able to explain to voters how the things you've done actually have impacted them for good. You're absolutely right. But for me, the, the bills that you just listed, a large reason why they weren't passed is because they didn't have public support. Why? Because no one was talking about the bills. And this goes back to what I've been saying on your show, what you've been saying on your show for God knows how long now. The Democrats have a fundamental problem communicating not only their wins, but what they want to win which is um, passage of bills that will make Black people safer, that will make America safer, safer to vote, safer to live, safer to function. And I know, I know more about what's going on with the Amazon 
prime situation in that there's a possibility that Congress could take could do something in legislation that would take away our two day prime shipping. I know more about that through commercials that have been paid for by lobbyists and special interest groups. I know more about that than I do about the George Floyd bill, just on a communications level. Why? Because they have invested in the media space and the ad buys to make sure that we know about that issue. Democrats have not been doing that. I can't remember the last time they have done something like that. Probably Obamacare. And it is frustrating to me because, like you said, we have wins under our belt on, on, a, on a federal level. But in Florida specifically, what Floridian Democrat do you know who actually knows any type of win that Florida has? either on the local level or on the federal level, because no one's talking about it. No one's communicating it to them. And they're not even packed, like when it is being communicated, they're not even packaging it like it's a win. They're packaging it like it's a problem. Who wants to hear about a problem all the time when we, the people, don't know, don't even know how to solve it? That's what we're voting for you for. So that's why I'm concerned with not only what's going on here, but what's going to happen come November, which is, frankly, Democrats are going to lose faith in the people who are already in their respective positions because they don't feel like the people in their respective positions have been doing anything because no one's talking about what they're doing in a positive light such that we can get behind them and actually support them. So until that happens, you know, in a phrase, we're screwed. Speaking of, in terms of how the, the troubles they have, let's talk about the, the debate last night in Pennsylvania, uh, where John Fetterman is leading in all the polls. Uh, he's won statewide. He's lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania. Democrats are high on his candidacy uh, because he's a strong progressive. But there is a problem because of an incident that took place in Braddock, Illinois, when he was the mayor in 2013, Fetterman, with a shotgun in hand, confronted and detained an unarmed black man he suspected was involved in a shooting near his home. During last night's debate, Fetterman was questioned if he would handle the situation differently if it happened today. This was the exchange uh, with uh, Pennsylvania Representative uh, Malcolm Kenyatta, who's also running against him. The third candidate is Connor Lamb. Check this out. Both of your counterparts on the stage tonight have criticized you for the 2013 incident when you were mayor of Braddock. Yeah. You confronted an unarmed black man who you believe may have been involved in a shooting mm -hmm. and detained him with a gun until police arrived. If presented with the same situation, would you do anything differently today? You have 60 seconds. Well, it's, it's important that, that we first acknowledge the, 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 the harm based on uh, over-policing and profiling in the black community. It's important that we do that. But it's also important we contextualize Braddock as well, too. Braddock is a community that's 75 per percent black. And I showed up in Braddock 20 years ago to teach GED classes because I wanted to help young people get their lives on track. And I ran for mayor 17 years ago because two of my students were gunned down because Braddock had a significant gun violence problem. And after running for mayor and winning, I attacked the gun violence problem in Braddock. And we succeeded. My proudest accomplishment was going five and a half years we stopped the killing. Uh, in 2013, I was outside on a cold January afternoon. I heard a burst of gunfire with my young son. I made a split second decision to uh, call 911, get my son to safety, and intercept an individual, the only individual out, running from where the gunfire came, and intercept him until our first responders arrived as Braddock's chief law enforcement officer and as the mayor. 15 second follow up though, would you do anything differently today? It's, it's not, it's certainly not a situation that anyone would want to be involved with with gun violence. But I'd like to point out that I'm the only Democrat on this stage that has successfully confronted crime and gun violence and has been in charge of a police department. Did you do it? Wait, 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 Mr. Lamb and Mr. Kenyatta, I am going to give you both a chance to answer on this. So the man involved in this incident who is incarcerated for a separate crime wrote to the Philadelphia Inquirer saying, quote, it is inhumane to believe one mistake should define a man's life. I hope he, meaning Mr. Fetterman, gets to be a senator. Uh, if that man is okay with it, Mr. Lamb, why aren't you? 60 seconds. Well, in the same statement, the man said that he believes to this day John is lying about the question of whether he pointed the shotgun at him. Um, the man is incarcerated, and John is one of the people who holds the keys to letting him out. He chairs the board of pardons. So I'm not surprised by that statement in the least. Um, and it's a kind thing for him to say. At the time, not only did Christopher say that John pointed the shotgun right in his chest, John said that to the police. You know, as a prosecutor, I always look at a 
police report written at the time to understand what actually happened. And if you look at it, to this day it says, Fetterman said he pulled the shotgun on the person in order to stop him. That's what John told the police at the time. That's what Christopher said at the time as well. But today, not only will John admit uh, that he was pointing, he won't admit that he was pointing the gun at this person, he also won't really answer your question as to whether he did anything wrong and should have done it differently. And I just think that's disqualifying for any of us who have to work hard to gain the trust of the black community. Mr. Kenyatta, same question. If the man who was involved in that incident says it's okay, why are you not okay with it? You have 60 seconds. So let me just be crystal clear because it's very rare we get John at an event. And so I'll say directly to the lieutenant governor, for somebody who has cut an image as an incredibly tough guy, you're so afraid of two little words. I'm sorry. You did take a 20-gauge shotgun, get in your pickup truck, travel into another town, and brandish that weapon at the chest of an unarmed black jogger. You did that. The problem is that John still, nine years later, refuses to do one of the most important things that you want from any leader. You want them to be self-reflective. And I think John has gotten away with this for too long, with this idea that as long as he didn't know the jogger was black, it was fine what he did. It was not okay what John did. And John, I hope tonight you would say those two simple words. I'm sorry. Mr. Fetterman, 30 seconds to respond yeah. on this incident. There, there's, there's, uh, I would like a lot to, to clarify. You know, I, I think it's important to, to mention that the, the people of Braddock who know me, that, that know my heart, know that, that 2013 had nothing to do with what, what they're saying today. There was no profiling or anything involved. They know that. And that's why they reelected me by overwhelming margins to two additional terms as, as mayor. And at, at, the, at the end of the day, uh, I want to be clear. Um, that never happened. I never pointed the weapon uh, at the individual. And you know, everyone in Braddock knows. And ev not only does everyone in Braddock know what happened in 2013, we know what this is about here on the Mr. Stage. Kenyatta, I'm going to give you 15 seconds. John, we, we get it. You have a black friend. The question is, did you point a 20-gauge shotgun at the chest of a black man? And you have an opportunity with all of Pennsylvania watching to say, I'm sorry. Are you going to say I'm sorry today, John? I, that never happened. So you're not going to say I'm sorry. That never happened. So you still refuse to say I'm sorry to this day. I'm the only Democrat that successfully confronted You're the only Democrat okay. who used a shotgun to chase down an unarmed black Gentlemen, man. Gentlemen, thank you. Okay. Lisa? So that was a lot of back and forth there, quite contentious. I'll start with you, Kelly. Um, look, Fetterman is leading in the polls. Uh, many Democrats believe that he uh, is uh, the best candidate to represent the state because, frankly, outside of Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is Alabama. They say that uh, he casts an image that, is a, that uh, can appeal uh, to those independent, conservative, Republican voters uh, in, in terms of uh, how he talks to them, how he represents himself. President Biden comes to Pennsylvania uh, look to deal with some bridges there. He meets them in some shorts. They, they look at that. But this, the question is, will it be problematic for black voters? He needs significant black turnout in Philadelphia. Well, I don't understand if Connor Lamb says that the police report says he, that he said that he pointed the gun at him why is he saying now that he didn't? I am not in the mind of that man to, you know, figure out that answer. What I can surmise is that it just simply doesn't look good on a national level to admit that, which is probably why he didn't say those two simple words that Malcolm Kenyatta was basically giving him on a silver platter to say in that debate, I'm sorry. You would think that those two simple words would be easy enough to say, given, you know, the circumstances of the case and the history there. But it will tarnish his his image if he says that. And he is more worried about his image than his his integrity at this point um, to say those two simple words. Now, when you're talking about Malcolm Kenyatta and the sense that he does need the black vote voter turnout in order to get this done. I absolutely agree with that. And my concern is that we still have this underlying homophobia in the Black community such that we can't fully support Malcolm Kenyatta in his entire being to get to the Senate because he is a gay Black man. And that is very frustrating to me because who he loves has nothing to do with how he is going to govern, how he is going to represent the state, which I think he would do 
phenomenally well, certainly better than somebody who put a 20 gauge shotgun in the chest of a black man that he didn't know and went out of his way to do so. Um, I hope he wins this race, Malcolm Kenyatta, but my cynicism is overriding my optimism at this point, simply because I know just how deep seated the homophobia is in the black community, such that it doesn't matter how good he is, how much he does, so long as he is a gay black man, you will think that he is not good enough for the role. But he's not running solely in the black community. Uh, the reality here, um, Michael, is that he's running for the Democratic primary for the United States Senate. You're going right. to have Democrats all across the state of Pennsylvania who mm -hmm. are voting. So it's not, Malcolm Kenyatta is not just appealing to African Americans. He's trying to appeal to white voters, Latino voters, Asian voters, yes. Native American voters. Uh, again, when you look at the polling data, Fetterman has a huge lead. Representative Connor Lamb is a member of Congress uh, who won a so-called red district. They say, oh, he's a, he's a kind of centrist, center-right that, that could actually win. A lot of establishment Democrats actually believe that Connor Lamb should be the U.S. Senator, U.S. US Senate nominee. But the reality is Fetterman uh, is doing quite well uh, in the polls. So right now, actually, the top two candidates uh, based upon polling are Fetterman and Lamb. And then Kenyatta is, uh, is, is coming in in third. But I think, Michael, what Fetterman is doing is he's doing the page from Donald Trump. Never apologize. Yeah, never apologize. And, and, and what happened? Trump won. Right. Never apologize and never admitting to it happening as well. Never apologizing, never admitting to it happening. Um, and, you know, he's doing uh, uh, he's bleeding in the uh, polls. Uh, but, you know, this is when you deal with uh, statewide races, this is one of the problems oftentimes that African-Americans run into uh, in statewide races, like for U.S. Senate, for instance, because when we look at, say, the Congressional Black Caucus, I think it's about 57 are in the House. A House district is 710,000 people based upon the 2010 census, uh, the redistricting from the 2010 census. But when you run for Senate, now you got to appeal to millions of people, statewide race, to different ethnicities, religions, you know, different things like this, races. So it's a different ball game. So uh, I, I like uh, Malcolm Kenyatta's uh, enthusiasm. I watched some of the, the debate, and uh, it was actually, they uh, showed some of it on MSNBC today as well. I also want to hear uh, some of their platforms also, their policies beyond this 2013 event incident, beyond this 2013 incident. I want to also hear some of their, their policy uh, <laughs> platforms as well. But, you know, this is yeah. This is what happens when you run statewide. This is a different ball game than running uh, in a district for uh, like the House of Representatives. And in fact, uh, Matt, um, the Fr Franklin and Marshall College poll um, came out um, uh, just the other day, uh, and uh, what it says here uh, is that uh, according to uh, this polling here, um, twenty six percent are undecided, but uh, as it stands right now. 17% uh, of the voters uh, say they will support, uh, first of all, um, 40, uh, four, here's the deal, 20% uh, of the Democratic voters said they support him and 44% said they were undecided. Okay, uh, that was last month. Now it's changed. Now uh, you're now dealing with um, a significant number. Fetterman is at 41% in Pennsylvania. Connor Lamb is at 17% in Pennsylvania. State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta is at 4% in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so, uh, again, I just think what you have here, I think if you have Fetterman, I think that it's this notion of, no, I'm not going to apologize, knowing full well that that appeals to a lot of voters. I think that's true. I think it, it does appeal to a lot of voters because we've seen that a lot of voters now like that Donald Trump brand of brashness and of, uh, you know, lack of apology. Look, I'm not going to ever say I'm wrong. I'm not going to ever say I did wrong. The problem, I think, for Fetterman here is that he's actually said publicly a number of times that he did, in fact, pursue the person, that he had reason to believe the person was involved. And as Mr. Lamb said, that he indicated he did point the weapon. I guess his thought now is that he has nothing to lose uh, and really you know, by not admitting it. And he has, I guess, something to lose uh, by saying he did, in fact, point the gun, considering the national 
zeitgeist. Um, but I, I really don't understand why you backtrack on that because I found an article as I was preparing for the show today where he indicated that he did in fact pursue him. So he might be concerned that this looks enough like the Ahmaud Arbery case in Georgia that he doesn't want to admit it and have any of the flack related to that. And I think that might be the concern. But you know, he's so far ahead in the polls, maybe he's thinking there's just no purpose in right. admitting it at this point. All right, folks, I uh, got to go to a break. We come back. Um, ooh, Kevin McCarthy, your punk ass busted for lying. We're going to talk about that. Plus, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is on the witness stand today. She is fighting for her political life because of some constituents are suing to keep her off the ballot because of her involvement in the January 6th white domestic terrorist incident at the U.S. Capitol. We're going to talk about all of that and more uh, next to Roland Martin on Filter. Don't forget to download the Black Star Network app. Folks, uh, we're trying to hit 50,000 downloads by May 1st. Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Also, please join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar you give goes to support this show. Checks and money orders sent to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app is dollar sign, uh, RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle, you can send to Roland at RolandSMartin.com and Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back. I'm Dr. Jackie, and on a next A Balanced Life, it takes a village to raise a child, and truer words have never been spoken. If you're raising a child, you know that it's a blessed challenge like no other, even more so if your child has a disability. We'll talk to parents and our expert panelists about the best way forward for your child to help you maintain your own sanity on a next A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie on Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Black Star Network is this. Hold no punches. A real uh, revolutionary right now. <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? I'm Angie Stone. Hi, I'm Teresa Griffin. Oh, Roland. Hey, Roland, I am so disappointed that you are not here, first of all. Um, where's our dance? It's like we get a dance in every time I see you. And so now you're not here for me to dance with, sir. You and your ascot. I need it. I need that in my life right now. Okay. Um, I love you, Roland. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> Okay, if y'all want a great laugh, whoa, I got a good one for you. So, there's a new book coming out by two reporters for the New York Times. And in that book, uh, they talked about a conversation that Republican minority leader in the House, Kevin McCarthy, had with other Republicans, where he said that he was going, he was disgusted by what happened with uh, Donald Trump on January 6th, and he was going to ask Donald Trump to resign. <clears throat> now, the book 
comes, so they, they release an excerpt of the book, all right? So it comes out. Well, Kevin McCarthy, being as arrogant and indignant as he possibly can, he decides to release a statement just condemning, just condemning the New York Times. I mean, angry as all get out. Y'all, so I, I got to show this, y'all. This is, I'm, I'm telling y'all, this is so hilarious. This is what he put out. The New York Times reporting on me is totally false and wrong. It comes as no surprise that the corporate media is obsessed with doing everything it can to further a liberal agenda. This promotional book tour is no different. If the reporters were interested in truth, why would they ask for comment after the book was printed? The past year and a half have proven that our country was better off when President Trump was in the White House and rather than address the real issues facing Americans, the corporate media is more concerned with profiting from manufactured political intrigue from politically motivated sources. Our country has suffered enough under failed one-party uh, democratic rule and no amount of media no amount of media, y'all, no amount of media, no amount of media, ignorance and bias will stop Americans from delivering a clear message this fall that it is their time for change. Okay, y'all, that's uh, the deal. That's, that's what he said. Okay, now check this out, y'all. I got, I got a good one for you. So last night, last night on Maddow, Last night on Maddow, y'all, um, check this out. They had the reporters from the New York Times on the show. Well, they kind of released the audio of the conversation. And let's just say the conversation didn't quite go exactly like Kevin McCarthy thought it was going to go. So this is what was played last night on Rachel Maddow's show. Go. Hear this. Liz, you on the phone? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I guess there's a question. When, when we were talking about the 25th Amendment resolution, um, yeah. and you asked if, if, you know, what happens if it gets there after he's gone, is, is there any chance, are you hearing that he might resign? Is there any reason to think that might happen? I've had a few discussions. My gut tells me no. Um, I'm seriously thanking for having that conversation with him tonight. I haven't talked to him in a couple days. Um, from what I know of him, I mean, you guys all know him too. Do you think he'd ever back away? But what, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to call him. My this, this is what I think. Um, no one will pass the House. I think there's a chance he'll pass the Senate even when he's gone. Um, and I think there's a lot of different ramifications for that. Now, I haven't had a discussion with the Dems that if he did resign, would it not happen? Now, this is one personal fear I have. Um, I do not want to get into any conversations about Pence pardoning anything like that. I mean, the only discussion I would have with him is that I think this will pass, and it would be my recommendation we should be done. Um, I mean, that would be my take, but I don't think he would take it, but I don't know. Mmm. Y'all, it gets better. They got more video, excuse me, audio, where he says... I don't understand why these social media companies are not banning the accounts of some of these Republicans tweeting crazy stuff. Uh, 
Um, Matt, I don't think Kevin McCarthy had a good night's sleep last night when they uh, <laughs> dropped this audio on his punk ass. And so now all of a sudden, we, we, we know he lying. We know he making stuff up. We know he's sitting here just, dog, Republicans are livid. Because he's sitting here, no, it ain't happened. Dog, they got you on tape. <laughs> and the folk who gutted his ass is a fellow Republican. Matt, this is straight up manna from heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Served up on a platter, you're right. Look, I mean, how you gonna lie about something as equivocal as, as unequivocal, excuse me, as it would be my recommendation that he should resign? I mean, that's clear as day, and I think it's part of that same playbook of just keep lying and try to act like it didn't happen and hope people forget about it. But this, I mean, you're saying, look, the corporate media and all this BS. No, you clearly said it would be my recommendation that he should resign and express that you didn't think that he would do that. I, I don't know why you would even lie about this instead of trying to spin it in some other direction. But I'm glad that it's being served up because he looks like a fool, as he should. I, I mean, I, I, I'm just sitting here, Michael, just hollering, laughing at mm -hmm. these Republicans who are just sitting here. And this is what I need everybody to remember when I was on ABC this week. What did I tell y'all about these Republicans? What did I tell Chris Christie to his face? Y'all are more concerned with power and party over principles and patriotism. Exhibit 3,978. Oh, absolutely. These are, these are traitors who violated their oath to defend the Constitution against enemies, both foreign and domestic. And they're trying to protect the domestic terrorists who incited the January 6, 2021 uh, insurrection, which is a continuation of the Civil War and the end of Reconstruction. So I watched Rachel Maddow's show live last night, recorded it also, watched the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. He continued the discussion. And there's more. The other thing is, Roland, there's more audio. The, the, the authors of the book, uh, uh, This Will Not Pass, they said they have more audio. Oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, hey, dog. Hey, dog. Hey, dog. <laughs> I, I, one of them tweeted me today. One of them texted me today. <laughs> Get them on the show. Get them on the show. There's more. And see, this is why that we have to understand. This is why these traitors, traitors Republicans have to be destroyed in the 2022 midterm election. If these domestic terrorist sympathizers and, and traitors to the Constitution, if they take back control of the House and the Senate, dude, they, they're trying to take us back to 1890, the Mississippi State Convention, where, they, where, the, where the white supremacists in the, in the state, in the, in the state uh, uh, legislature instituted a poll taxes and literacy tests and African-Americans were the majority of the population and the majority of the voters in the state of Mississippi. You know, so we have to un we have to connect all this history together and understand why these domestic terrorist sympathizers have to be stopped, period. All they care about is power, Kelly. And yes. again, with all of this, let me remind people what I told Chris Christie to his face and Sarah Isker who worked for mm -hmm. the, the Jeff Sessions uh, Department of Justice, and they were like, well, we, you know, we worked against him. Yeah, but y'all supported his ass and your work for him. Here we go. But the real I appreciate the speech, uh, Governor, but the reality is this. Um, you have to admit, Sarah, you have to admit the role that you played in putting the person in leadership who is driving conspiracy theories. It's one thing to condemn them after the fact, but you have to own up to the role that you played in putting the person in power. The time we both ran campaigns yeah. against. No, 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 no. One second. No, no. First of all, I don't think anything to you. Can I finish? First off, I'm not defending you. And second, I ran against Donald Trump. You also coached him. I ran against Donald Trump. You ran against. Here's the deal. You ran against him. But when a person has principles, morals, and values, they do not support them, even if you lose. And what they say is, what they 
they say is, I choose patriotism and the country yeah. over party I, I, and power. I'll and see. the problem was, too many Republicans chose yeah. power in riding yeah. with Donald right. Trump as opposed to patriotism yeah. in America. Sleep, I'll sleep fine tonight with you judging my morals. Well, guess what? As a <laughs> voter, as a, as a yeah. voter who has 13 nieces right. and nephews, what I also want to yeah. see in America are Republicans and Democrats who have the guts to stand up yeah. to narcissists, to folks who lie, to folks who see the human live yeah. a country in the wrong direction. And what that yeah. man has unleashed on this country, any Republican who stood with him has to own it and accept the role that they played. Yeah, well, that's fine. I'll accept the role that I played in the 2016 election running against him. And I'll accept but the you, role... But you him, let, him, let him finish his point now. Let him Excuse finish his point. Me. And I'll accept the role that I played in my belief that Hillary Clinton was not the right person to be president. We all get to make choices, Roland, in this democracy. I made my choice. I'm on record of my choice. And I'm not walking away from my choice. But it does not preclude me from being able to be critical when the person that I did support does things that I am against. And so this false choice that you're trying to set up, that false? Uh, it's, it's a false choice and one that the American people are not going to buy either. Well, mm-hmm, Kelly. They put that punk fool thug in power, and guess what? Yes. We're seeing Kevin McCarthy, who gives a speech condemning Trump, but then took his ass down to Mar-a-Lago, sucking up to him with the photo and everything. That's what all these Republicans do. They suck up to Donald Trump. They do not stand up for principle. They stand up for power. And, and that's exactly how Trump came to be. I mean, what Chris Christie said was valid in that, yes, he did make his choice. I don't think that he thought that Donald Trump would do what he did. I don't know if anybody really thought that. If anything, I think that he thought that Hillary Clinton was the worst choice and he thought that Donald Trump could be controlled. Like somehow once he got into office, all of a sudden he would be presidential and statement like. Um, yeah. I don't know why he thought that, but <laughs> most First of all, he, he showed his that. ass before he even got in there. We knew exactly who he was. Point. And black people knew exactly who that thug punk was. And and that's my point. It's like when you see somebody do the same thing all you know over and over again and you don't believe it, you know, that's on you. But I also have to, you know, defer to his own line of thinking and that he really thought that this man could change for the sake of power, like you said. But that's not what happened. But going back specifically to the call between Liz Cheney and Kevin McCarthy, um, when I heard the tape the first time, I just cried laughing because, it, you know, outside of the political bubble, just looking at it objectively, this is a receipt. And the fact that he lied to the, uh, what was it, Post, New York Times? Um, he lied to a newspaper about what they reported. No, he lied to America. He put that on his Twitter account. He lied to everybody. He thought he could lie until they hit his punk ass with the tape. Mm -hmm. But what's ironic to me, and I agree, but what's ironic to me is that mm. for months now, um, if not over a year, because Liz Cheney is part of the uh, January 6th committee, Liz Cheney has been telling us that these Republicans were like, you know, anti-Trump for the longest time. So the fact that we actually have something on tape proving her point, and then what's further, he is the one who's saying it to Liz Cheney, who is on record on the news, in papers, in God knows what other kind of media, saying, hey, they're saying one thing on, you know, on the outset, but... To me, they're saying something completely different, and everybody just kind of brushed her off, whether it's because she's a woman or because she, you know, is the daughter of another politician, whatever. Mm -hmm. They just kind of brushed off that sentiment that she had. She was firm in it. She was like, hey, I'm not the only one who thinks like this. I'm just the only one who's saying it out loud. Hey, Bob, and Kevin McCarthy is proof that she is not the only one who thought like that, but she is the only one who thought it out loud. And then for him to double down and lie on it, with this receipt, I mean, like you said, manna from heaven. Well, bottom lines is here. Uh, we know <laughs> doggone well they some damn liars, and now they getting busted. All right, y'all, uh, we got to go to a break. We'll be back on Roller Mark Unfiltered on the Black Star Network.
Patrol Grooming. That's right. It's a men's grooming company that delivers on this promise every day to men everywhere. Everything we do, every product we make is designed to help you to present your best self. It's a promise they've kept since 1991 when they first introduced the Bump Patrol brand, the number one men's product for smooth, bump-free, shave, and silky skin. Millions of customers count on their exceptional skin care products, which can be found at more than 30,000 retail stores in more than 50 countries around the world. Now you can have exceptional beard and skin care products that are as unique as you are. Fellas, as we prepare to head back out into the world as COVID restrictions are being lifted, it's time to get our groove back. So visit www.patrolgrooming.com to order Patrol Grooming Box and use the discount code hashtag Rollin30. That's hashtag Rollin30 for a 30% discount at checkout. Folks, be sure to support those that support Roland Martin Unfiltered. That includes patrol grooming. I'm Dr. Jackie, and on a next A Balanced Life, it takes a village to raise a child, and truer words have never been spoken. If you're raising a child, you know that it's a blessed challenge like no other, even more so if your child has a disability. We'll talk to parents and our expert panelists about the best way forward for your child to help you maintain your own sanity on a next A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie on Black Star Network. This week on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr, reparations, is it finally time? Two of the country's foremost authorities on the subject will join me to try to answer that very question. A powerful installment of The Black Table with me, Greg Carr, right here, only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Eric Nolan. I'm Shantae Moore. Hi, my name is Latoya Luckett, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. police officers accountable is the ability to record them. It was a video that helped convict the officers who killed George Floyd. It was a video uh, to help convict the officer who killed Laquan McDonald. A Santa Ana, California council member says police are now playing loud copyrighted music to keep videos of them from being posted. Check this out. Oilo, está poniendo música. Porque él sabe en, en mi canal no puedo poner videos con música. ¿Has visto videos donde dicen, oh, no tengo derechos a la música? Neta. No me quieren. Estos no me quieren. Folks, Santa Ana Council Member Jonathan Ryan Hernandez joins me now. The Santa Ana Police Chief David Valentine also released a statement about the incident. We're going to read that in a second. Well, I read that nonsense first. So watch this. Santa Ana Police Department is aware of a video that has surfaced involving one of our officers. We're committed to serving our community, and we understand the concerns as it relates to the video. The Santa Ana Police uh, Department takes seriously all complaints regarding the service provided by the department and the conduct of its employees. Our department is committed to conducting complete, thorough, and objective, objective investigations. My expectation is that all police department employees perform their duties with dignity and respect in the community we are hired to serve. Yeah, okay, that's great. But, but Councilman, let's just, let's just be real here. By, by them playing the music, what it does is it keeps uh, those, the videos gets blocked when you post them on Instagram because of uh, the uh, rights, copyright right management. That is correct. Yes, it, it does infringe upon our First Amendment rights. And um, as an elected official and somebody who grew up in that neighborhood, it's important um, for me to to protect our citizens and to make sure that I do everything I can to protect our, our First Amendment rights. You know, I, I just sit here and again, I, you watch, uh, you know, what is going on here. And what you have is you have these cops uh, who are clearly playing games. They got together and decided, oh, we know how to stop these videos from going viral. 
That's exactly what. So what? What do? What, what can you do? How can you change this? How can you impact this? Well, for one, um, I want to inform the public that you are well within your right to film the police. If it wasn't for those brave community members that um, that recorded um, the murders of people like George Floyd, if it wasn't for those brave community members that recorded the murder of my cousin, Brandon Lopez, who was killed by Anaheim Police Department in Santa Ana on September 28th of 2021, um, um, I was on site that day, but many members of the public recorded. Um, the, the point that I want to share is you are within your right as an American to film and um, in the instance that occurred on April 4th, I was um, getting ready for bed. It was about 1045 at night. And um, what a lot of people don't know is I was already on very high alert um, at 1045 at night um, because prior to this incident that was being filmed um, about closer to maybe 10 o'clock, um, there was nine officers parked in front of my house. Uh, nine patrol cars. Um, I ended up walking up to the uh, patrol cars and asking if everything was okay. They instructed me that there was an investigation. Uh, my street was closed from 7th Street and Rate down to Civic Center. Eventually, the cars dispersed, but um, given the most recent experience I had in losing my family member, um, I just uh, had a feeling of uncertainty. And um, as I was getting ready for bed, I heard the Disney music outside. I do have a 12-year-old daughter, so um, Disney music is pretty common in my household. And um, I walked out of my household, and um, to my surprise, you know, the footage speaks for itself. I walked up to this uh, investigation um, that was now concluded at this point to find these officers playing music to deter members of the public from recording. Uh, has there been any response from the police union? No. As far as I am aware, there has not been an official response. Uh, well, this is uh, certainly uh, quite interesting uh, in terms of how these cops are, are behaving. Uh, Matt Manning, th this is, I mean, th this shows you uh, how pathetic police officers are uh, by trying to stop. Look, if, if you're not doing anything wrong, guess what? You have no worries about getting videotaped. I think you're, you're dastardly. Absolutely right. oh. Matt, apologize. Yeah, go, no, no, go ahead. Matt, go ahead. I, I just think this is dastardly. I think they, especially with as much as police post on social media now to try to garner support, I think this is obviously very intentional with the intent of keeping it down. And it's interesting because I think it's going to potentially open them to liability in terms of the very obvious intent to infringe upon the First Amendment right. Not only do you have the right to record, but you have the right to disseminate it, right? You have the right to speak. So with them taking affirmative steps to try to prevent that to the councilman's point, I think they may be uh, bringing liability upon themselves. And it's really a sad thing that somebody would intentionally find a way or at least try to find a way to keep uh, these recordings off, especially with as often as you hear police say things like, well, we don't have a problem with recording because it shows that we're usually doing the right thing. This is intentional, obviously, and it's, it's dastardly because somebody really thought about a way to keep from the public uh, eye the the doings of these police department, this police department, and I think it's just a horrible thing. Um, but it's uh, powerful, of course, uh, Kelly, uh, when we see how police in this country do all they can not to be held accountable. If, if I may yeah. share, yeah, Jonathan, go ahead. Um, my sincerest apologies. I just felt it was important um, because you mentioned. Um, you mentioned that this is starting to be a practice we're seeing more commonly. Um, and what, what exactly is, is uh, the goal of this? What are you trying to hide? Um, what is more sinister about this act is that um, the officer's body cam was off when I approached. And that's not good practice. Um, it, it just makes me concerned about what, what could this have potentially escalated to. Um, and so I have to remind members of the community of my city um, that we as a city are, are having a response um, to these issues of misconduct where other cities have tried to sweep them under the rug. Um, we are looking to introduce an ordinance that will ban this practice, um, and uh, it should have already been banned by our department. Um, I, I don't have a response as to why they didn't immediately ban it, but I did my due diligence in introducing this ordinance, which we did um, over the last meeting that we had, and it'll be finalized, um, I want to say, by, by the second meeting of May. 
but to remind the members of the public why is accountability so elusive when it comes to police departments, I'll tell you why. There are over 19,495 incorporated cities, towns, and villages in the United States. To date, there are nearly 200 verified oversight commissions in the United States. The need for accountability and change could not be more clear. There were two other officers there with this officer. Um, and those two other officers were unwilling to stop this behavior. So much so that at nearly 11 o'clock at night, an elected official had to get involved. Um, and mind you, I don't carry a badge and a gun. The only thing I bring with me are people's voices. But um, in this case here, the public is engaging in oversight for our city because we don't have that yet. But something that I am very proud of is we will have police oversight in the coming months. Well, that's why, Kelly, I, I have long maintained if an officer does not turn on or turns off your body camera, that should be a part of the, the hiring practices that they would be immediately fired. Absolutely. Um, it should be in all protocols to make sure that your body camera's on, to make sure that anything that you have to do in order to either apprehend somebody, approach somebody, whatever, like it has to be followed to a T. Otherwise, there should be, you know, serious repercussions for those actions. My issue, on top of everything that um, the councilman has said, as well as Matthew, is that not only is this you know, a despicable act, it is dangerous for all parties involved. I mean, can you imagine, you know, God forbid something happened to the councilman as he was trying to cross the street to approach the officer and the officer can't hear what's going on with another uh, citizen because he's trying to cover his own butt in something that he's not supposed to be doing anyway. So this is just bad practice overall. It's not even about, you know, the lack of accountability or trying to evade accountability. You are putting people in harm's way trying to cover your own ass. That is an issue. And if you have officers on your force who would rather cover their ass than cover the person, you know, protect the person to protect and serve, then you have a problem with not only yourself as an officer, but the entire department, if they do not, you know, reprimand such behavior and change the policy so something like this won't happen again, you have an issue from the root of this tree, not just one bad apple. Well, and that's exactly what we're seeing. And I think uh, if we have more council members uh, like Jonathan, uh, Michael, uh, we will see something happen. You have to change those contracts and city councils have that authority. Yes. And, and this is this is an example of why elections have consequences. Roland and Council Member uh, Hernandez, uh, thanks for coming on, sharing this information with us. This is one of the reasons why elections have consequences, uh, because, as you said, the, the, the uh, police unions contract. Right. That's usually uh, oftentimes in many municipalities controlled by the city council. OK. And what what the city agrees to is the city council that votes on the police union's contract. I just had a quick question for Council Member Hernandez. Um, any idea how long this practice has been going on? One and two, have there any, been any incidences where you've had shootings or robberies or something like that where the uh, body cam footage is tampered with be because of this uh, copywritten music being played? Thank you. That's a, a, a great question. Um, number one is um, to, I'm going to start first with the um, question of, is this something that we have seen in Santa Ana? Um, this is my first time as a policymaker and as a community member seeing this practice firsthand. Um, I, I've seen it on the Internet. I really, to be honest, I, I really didn't understand what was happening. I saw um, the Always Film the Police, Mr. Checkpoint. Um, had posted a video um, some time back, and it was, I believe, a Beverly Hills officer playing Sublime Santeria, and um, I also saw one of an officer playing uh, Taylor Swift, and I, I didn't really understand what the goal of these officers, um, what, what they were, what were they trying to accomplish, um, because it's such high level um, knowledge that you would have to have a, a strong understanding of IPs and um, and computer technology and copyright infringement 
that your common citizen, I mean, even your common public servant, isn't going to be up to speed as to what this practice is really about. And it's very sinister because we're trying to um, build bridges um, with communities that have been disenfranchised and marginalized through police violence. And this is the response that we're getting. Um, and what's ironic to me is the demographic of the community that I live in. It's a very Latino community. And um, this officer was using two films used to bridge to the Latinx community, um, utilizing Encanto and Coco to now silence them. So um, irony at its finest, um, it's childish, it's despicable. And as a policymaker, right. I, I could never stand for it. And, um, and to answer your other question, um, I have done some research and I have found that there have been multiple instances um, across this country where police have been utilizing this tactic. However, I have not seen um, any um, local body of government do anything about it. So um, I wanted us to be uh, at the forefront of making sure that we um, stick to the demands of the people and, and fight for accountability and transparency. Uh, Matt, final question. I just wanted to actually say something regarding the, the oversight committees. I think one of the big issues, and Councilman, please elucidate us if I'm wrong, with those oversight committees across the country is they usually don't have any teeth. So you have a group of citizens that get to look at a police shooting or a police incident, but they don't actually get to recommend anything that would have any teeth or any kind of consequence on the police department. So my question would be, in Santa Ana, how are y'all considering giving that oversight committee some actual teeth so there can be a measurable consequence if officers do something like this? Yeah, that's a phenomenal question. Um, for starters, um, I have been part of the police oversight um, committee that, that helped create what uh, will then become the, the actual policy we adopt. And um, I've been on this committee since last year, and um, it has been a journey um, where we've met with members of the community. Um, we, we met with experts of POBAR, Police Officer Bill of Rights. Um, we've even met with law enforcement um, to create um, a model of oversight that we felt was going to be um, the strongest. Um, our goal is to have one of the strongest and ethical um, oversight commissions in the country. And um, in the city of Santa Ana, what we are proposing is to have a commission with subpoena power, investigatory power, and um, the ability to hire and fire police chiefs. Um, we are also making it very clear, um, as evidenced in the video, law enforcement have been investigating themselves, and they're not willing to step in and correct themselves. So um, something that's very important to members of our community is having a oversight board that excludes law enforcement for that very reason. Um, in the city of Santa Ana, since 2016 to today, we have had over 207 um, civilian um, filed complaints against officers. Only six have resolved um, in favor of civilians. So clearly, police overseeing themselves is not working. Um, in addition to that, our commission, um, I will be fighting for um, these commissions to be justice impacted friendly so that members that have been through the justice system, members that know the difference between an officer doing his job correctly and an officer abusing his power, um, that members of these communities that have experienced injustice firsthand um, can have an opportunity to also serve on these commissions. Um, I am a true believer that change starts at the bottom and, um, you know, I have been impacted by police violence myself, um, but I didn't let that take the hope that I have away from my heart and from how I serve my community. And um, for anybody who thinks that my fight for accountability and justice is anti-police, I want to remind them that they're wrong. To be um, bold in the face of injustice isn't to be anti-anything. That's what the people deserve. I am not going to blindly serve a political party or a ideal um, you know, set of rules that you know, a political party says um, is important. What I am going to do is always meet people where they're at and, um, and fight for the disenfranchised and marginalized. And in Santa Ana, unfortunately, we have a lot of fighting to do. All right. Councilman, we surely appreciate it. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you.
All Power right, folks, uh, coming up uh, next on Roland Martin Unfiltered, we'll talk Earth Day. Uh, and, yeah, we should be caring about uh, the environment as well, so look forward to having that conversation. Uh, and then also, I got my crazy as my people segment, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. Now, why, how you going to try to lie on the stand? See, y'all can lie in person, but you can't lie on the stand because that's called perjury. Ooh, I can't wait to show y'all video. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. When did you know that mm. this is what I wanted? I think right after high school, because in high school I was in all the plays. Well, I was always funny, mm. but I didn't know nobody would pay me for it, you know? And then I saw Eddie Murphy. This was like 84 when I saw Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy was the hottest thing in the whole wide world, not just comedy. But anyway, he saved Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. If he hadn't started that, that show would be gone. He, uh, he had done 48 hours, trading places, his first Beverly Hills cop, could wear the hell out of a red leather suit, and he wasn't but 23 years old. He was rich enough to pee cream, and he got all that telling jokes. I said, shit, I've been funny my whole life. I didn't know people give you money like that, so mm -hmm. I went and got some Red Fox albums. I went down to my mama's basement where I was living anyway. And I stood in that mirror and played them albums and them jokes until I could tell them like they were mad. Wow. And that started me doing jokes. And then I went and did comedy in the street. I was standing on State Street, tell jokes and pass my hat. And white folks would come up and just hand me money. And I liked it. Hey everybody, it's your girl Lunell. So what's up? This is your boy Earthquake. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, we've got some breaking news. Remember Pamela Moses, the black woman who was hit to prison, uh, was hit to jail in Tennessee for illegally voting, then a huge outcry. Well, guess what? The prosecutors have decided to drop all charges. Sam Levine put this tweet out a couple of hours ago. Prosecutors are dropping all criminal charges against Pamela Moses, the Memphis woman sentenced to six years in prison for trying to register to vote. She was granted a new trial in February, but prosecutors said today they won't pursue it. Well, thank goodness. It only makes sense uh, for them to actually do that. So, uh, hello. Uh, but also, keep in mind, while that's happening, uh, Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, uh, He's registered to vote in three states, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. Oh, Republicans love talking about voter fraud. Uh, how about one of your own? You got the, you got one of the biggest voter fraud cases happened with Republicans in North Carolina. Oh, remember the, Republic, the two Republicans in the villages in Florida who voted for Trump? So ain't it amazing how Republicans love talking about voter fraud, but it's always their people. Yeah. Uh, we see what's going on there. All right, folks, let's talk about Earth Day. Uh, that's what's, uh, what today is. And so folks all across the world uh, have been celebrating Earth Day. Uh, and look, it's interesting uh, to have people, especially all these Christian conservatives who love talking about Jesus uh, and being stewards, uh, but, but they never really want to focus on uh, the reality of this planet and how we are destroying it. Uh, and I, I, I tweeted this out. Y'all remember... So David Attenborough, um, he actually voiced, there was a documentary that was on Apple Plus. That's the amazing documentary uh, that showed how our um, uh, planet changed during COVID. And it showed literally how uh, species that before uh, were not doing well, all of a sudden began to uh, do well, how plants begin to regenerate, how all of a sudden so many things begin to happen in our society because we weren't always flying everywhere and driving everywhere. It was an incredible, uh, incredible documentary. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to pull the graphic up so you can actually see it uh, in a second. But again, it shows you what happens when we take care of uh, Mother Earth. So let's talk about regenerative agriculture. Well, what exactly is that? Joining me right now, uh, is Urvashi Rangage. He's the chief science advisor at Grace Communications Foundation uh, to explain exactly what this is. And so, Urvashi, regenerative agriculture, what is that? <laughs> yeah, regenerative agriculture is sort of actually an old way of doing agriculture. It's the way a lot of traditional cultures farmed and indigenous communities actually grew food, which was 
people who were really knowledgeable about the lands around them, and really it was regional expert land stewards, who uh, were farming their food in a way that was really efficient. They were looking for how to grow best, what were optimal conditions, and they did it by using nature's force. Nature's force to protect against pests and diseases. Nature's force to fertilize. Um, and nature's forced to actually give us nutrient-dense food. Um, with the Industrial Revolution after World War II, we really started turning to industrial agriculture, the use of lots of chemicals, lots of drugs on a daily basis, um, millions and millions and millions of pounds of it going into our earth every single year just from farming. And it turns out, it's not such a great idea, and more isn't more, actually. More without the natural biology just sort of flows out and pollutes waterways and uh, even pollutes our air. And industrial agriculture has actually ruined much of our topsoil in this country and continues to do so, which takes away our fertility. It takes away soil's holding capacity for water, for nutrients, and also for carbon. And a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions that we see as a result are because we've lost the carbon from the ground. We've lost it from the soil. And our industrial farming practices um, simply have not helped at all. And regenerative agriculture really offers an interesting hope we can actually reverse this tide. Nature's been gracious enough to let us be able to do that. And that's what regenerative agriculture is really all about, is how do we farm with nature, with its biology, and preserve that system so that we actually increase fertility, increase nutrient density, increase soil carbon holding capacity over time. So, but where is this done? We've seen an increase in urban farming. And so uh, where, where and how this can be done? Regenerative agriculture can actually be done in multiple different places. If you look at um, livestock production, for example, we have a lot of grasslands in the United States. Those lands cannot be used to grow crops, but they're great for animals. And it turns out next to forests, they have the second largest capacity to sequester carbon. So raising animals regeneratively out on our grasslands is an excellent way that we can actually be regenerative and regrading our lands. You mentioned urban agriculture, and that's sort of the other side of things. And there are also ways that even within our urban centers, we can think about farming in a more regenerative way. And again, we have loads of rooftop gardens, school gardens, and it's really thinking, how do you add fertility? Are you going to buy chemical fertilizer or maybe compost your food scraps and then use that as the sort of liquid gold or black gold in your growing in urban centers? So there's lots of opportunities to grow regeneratively and foster your regional biology wherever you are. And in a lot of ways, it's kind of um, celebrating our region's terroir in many ways, because every region's a little bit different. Every region has its own biology and its own conditions. And in that way, regenerative agriculture is not a one-size-fits-all sort of program, but really celebrates that regionality, allowing people to grow food in the best way for their region. Oh, uh, let's see here. Uh, Kelly got a feeling like she's trying to be an urban farmer. So, Kelly, your question first. Um, no, but <laughs> you know, um, you you know, you all stuff running. No, um, I I do have a green thumb when I try, but um, I do prefer grocery stores. But speaking of which, given the food deserts that we have in urban communities now, how do you reconcile that with this initiative? Meaning, yes, we need grocery stores um, that are, you know, sustainable and the like, but how do you reconcile that need with also the need to, you know, grow your own food, regenerative, uh, uh, set, like many ecosystems, like you said? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot in there. I mean, one is if you're growing your own food, and obviously most people in urban centers don't grow their own food, but should people in urban centers have access to food that is produced really well without um, 
pesticides and synthetic fertilizers and lots of chemicals and drugs, I mean, everybody deserves access to that. And in a lot of ways, we're talking about um, why we have to change the current agricultural system that we have that produces 95% of our food and how degenerative that is to our environment, to our landscape, to our people, to our health. And uh, so it is really a question of how do we increase access um, to these better produced foods? It's a bunch of different ways. And, you know, your point about food deserts is a valid one. Um, and this doesn't necessarily solve the food desert issue, but nor does industrial agriculture either. And providing food to people that is nutrient dense, it's almost like a human right. And we need to start thinking about our food in a much more uh, thoughtful way so that we can produce food that is truly healthy for everybody. Uh, Matt. So my question is what the legislative component is to this, if there is a thought in that respect. Are, are there any states or local governments or even governments abroad that have mandated this, who looked at the science and said, you know, we, we really need to intervene. And as such, we're going to require uh, commercial producers to institute regenerative um, mechanisms. Is there anything like that that you've seen? <clears throat> That's a great question, and um, the answer is we've started to do that in some ways, and we've got a long way to go. Um, on the national front, we've got the organic food production standard. It isn't the end of the story, but it's really a fantastic foundation for what regenerative needs to look like in the sense that it actually is the only federally mandated policy program that bans the use of most industrial pesticides, that bans the use of sewage sludge as fertilizer, that bans the use of synthetic fertilizers um, in producing agriculture. So those are just some of the things organic does, as well as um, how that land is managed. Now, to do that, we can do it even better, and we can probably get policies in place that can do that. A lot of those policies revolve around where science currently is right now, which is understanding this incredible microbial world under our feet in the earth, that dirt is not dirt, it's alive. And the more we steward it and the more biodiversity it has, the better off the system, the better off its resilience, the better off our nutrient density. And um, so you're seeing in a lot of states, soil health policies that are being introduced and bills that are being introduced at the state levels, at regional levels, at local levels, um, that are trying to take these practices even further. So there's a lot of opportunities going on right now. You should pay attention to what's going on in your own region, um, but also make sure to pay attention to what's happening to organic. It's um, definitely a foundation for how we need to approach how we are producing our food. All right, well, look, we appreciate it celebrating Earth Day. We thank you so very much for joining us. Happy Earth Day. Thank you. All right, folks. Uh, coming up next on the show, uh, we are going to got Education Matters segment. We're going to talk a little uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Oh, but going to break, folks, earlier today, I was uh, in Maryland uh, for the uh, 75th birthday celebration for uh, Radio One. Go to the video, y'all, please. Thank you. <coughs> the 75th birthday celebration for Radio One founder Kathy Hughes. Uh, of course, uh, and so she had an event uh, at her uh, home there, and so uh, a lot of people she invited out. Uh, of course, uh, Pastor Charles Jenkins performed, uh, and so we had a great time there, uh, party and dancing. Uh, of course, uh, Radio One now is Urban One, owns TV One, more than 50 radio stations, digital assets as well, and so a uh, great time had by all there. And so I uh, just want to give her uh, a birthday shout out. It must be like a April, like a really good month for the birthday shout outs uh, because um, uh, I'll, I'll be in Dallas uh, tomorrow celebrating my dad's 75th birthday. I'll show his photo a little bit later. And so, again, uh, we had a great time to see Tom Joyner. Yeah, he was out there as well. Uh, and then uh, a lot of dancing. That's the, of course, the owner of Ben's Chili Bowl right there. And uh, Alfred Liggins is her son. He is not a fan of dancing, but I made him get out there and dance with his son, Charlie. And that's what you're seeing right there. And so, uh, again, happy, happy birthday to uh, Radio One founder. 75th birthday to Kathy Hughes. We'll be right back. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch!
I'm real um, revolutionary right now. <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Hey, I'm Antonique Smith. Hey, I'm Arnaz Jane. Hi, this is Cheryl Lee Ralph, and you are watching Roland Martin, unfiltered. I mean, could it be any other way? Really? It's Roland Martin. All right, folks, uh, our black and missing uh, for the day. Uh, and uh, again, we're always, of course, uh, keeping our eye on these critical stories. LaJohn Flowers has not been seen since October 3rd, 2021 uh, from Bloomington, Indiana. He's five foot ten inches tall, weighs 200 pounds with brown hair and brown eyes. Anyone with information about LaJohn Flowers should call the Monroe County, Indiana Sheriff's Office at 812-349-2781, 812-349-2781. Three four nine two seven eight one. All right, folks. Uh, times for education matters. All right, folks. Fifty four percent of all students in public schools are people of color. Yet only twenty percent of principals are people of. Color, the national nonprofit New Leaders is partnering with two Atlanta historically black institutions, Morehouse College and Clark Atlanta University, to launch the Aspiring Principals Fellowship. It's program geared to boost the number of principals of color leading K through 12 schools. Uh, Jean, uh, is it dress, uh, des, dress for veins? Dress for veins? <laughs> Des Ravines. Des Ravines, the CEO of New Leaders, joins me from New York. So is it Jean or Jean? Gene. All right, Gene, Gene, glad to have you here. Here's the thing that I need people to understand when we talk about principles. We also talk about money. Uh, the reality is, you look at the salaries of principles, so when black people and others are being kept out of principles' positions, that's also impacting us economically. That is absolutely right, Ronan. So on average, a principal makes 25000 more than a teacher. You multiply that over a 20-year career, you're talking about over half a million. So not only are we talking about the opportunities that are afforded to ensure we can better educate our kids, there is a major economic component to this where uh, you have an opportunity to meaningfully increase your uh, earnings both annually and over the course of your career. And, and, and that's, uh, and I know some people are like, dang, Rolly, you always bring up the money. But that's the key. You just said it. Half a million dollars. That's money black people can be investing. That's money people give. And this is, this is the example of when we are frozen out of positions, how it impacts us, but also our lineage, our, the ability to build and create wealth. You are absolutely correct. And when you think about K-12 education, which is oftentimes a road to middle income lifestyle, oftentimes we tend to want to push our people of color, our black and young ex people into teaching and we absolutely need more teachers of color. What we don't do, we don't spend enough time talking about the importance of moving them into the principalship and into system leadership, which is often much more uh, lucrative in terms of how much they can make. So not only can they help impact the life outcomes of children, but they can be helping to close the wealth gap that exists between whites and blacks. And that is often overlooked when we talk about uh, K-12 public education. Questions for the panel. Michael, you first. 
Hey, uh, hello, Gene. Thanks for coming on today. So I was wondering, um, uh, reviewing this information, it talks about equity-focused school leaders. This is one of the things that you all create in the uh, uh, online certification program. Can you explain what are equity-focused school leaders? What does that mean, equity-focused? It's, it's an incredibly important question. If you look at all the research, one of the number one indicators that dictates a child's ability to be successful stems from whether or not the teacher, the principal, whether or not they have high expectations for that child, whether or not they can create a sense of belonging within the school community. When we talk about equity-focused leaders, we're talking about leaders who have high expectations, willing to hold themselves and their teachers accountable, and who sees the brilliance and potential of our children, particularly our black and brown children, which is often not the case right now in public education. Okay, thank Kelly. Sure. Um, we know the importance of having black teachers in the classroom, right? That is definitely something that we hear a lot more of. Um, and it makes sense because the teacher, him or herself, but in this case, black men, um, have more time with the child, right? And that is important, especially with black children. But what we do not see or hear about as often is the importance of having a black principal. And again, as I've said on this show before, I grew up in D.C. and had almost nothing but black administrators, black principals, black counselors, all of it. And I took for granted just how many school districts don't have that experience at all, whether you're in the urban, um, in an urban area or a rural area or a suburban area. So can you explain the importance of having black administrators in the school system and why that is just as important, if not more so, than having a black teacher in the classroom? Yes. So think about this for a second. We know in every industry, leadership matters, whether it's government, nonprofit sector, for-profit sector, schools are no different. The principle is tasked with creating the culture, setting the vision, hiring the teachers, inspiring the teachers. So if you want to have great teaching at scale, you need to have a great principle. There is not one example of a great school without a great principal. And while you are absolutely right, we spend a tremendous amount of time rightly focused on teachers. We don't spend nearly enough time focused on ensuring we have a great principal in every school. And we will never have great teaching at scale without ensuring we have great equity focused Black and brown principles serving our kids. Matt? Uh, I have two questions very quickly. So the first is, how does the actual fellowship work in relation to Morehouse and Clark? Is that where the educational programming is done? If I'm a, a part of the fellowship, that's where I actually do my classes. Is that kind of how it works? And then the second question is, I know that New Leaders does coaching for principals, so I'm interested in what that means. Does that mean you continue supporting them once they actually become principals? Both, both very good questions. First, in terms of how the program actually works. We're working with two preeminent historically black colleges in Morehouse and Clark and Atlanta, where we've co-designed the curriculum. We've worked in tandem to identify the instructors and we will be working in partnership to deliver the, the program. Your second question is so critically important. What often happens is that a principal goes into a school and they're left alone to try to figure it out. To your point, at New Leaders, we provide ongoing coaching. So the vision, once you become part of this fellowship, you will get ongoing coaching and support to ensure that you will set up for success. 
All right, then. Well, look, um, it sounds great. How has it gone thus far? How many principals have you placed? So we, had, we started with a pilot. The goal was to really see how do we ensure we are fine-tuning, we're setting up the program for success. Just to give you a sense, we launched the pilot in January, and the goal was to just have 20 students. Given the level of demand and excitement, we had to roughly double the amount for the pilot, represented in over 12 states, 100% of the participants, uh, fellows of color, black, and Latinx. We will launch the full program in January 2023. The response has been overwhelming. Just to give you a sense, when we first made the announcement, within the first two days, we received interest from over 500 potential fellows who wanted to learn more about the program. And our goal is to be the largest provider of equity-focused leaders of color in the country. So when we are at scale, we're envisioning serving five to 750 leaders a year. All right, then. Well, Gene, look, uh, congratulations. Uh, keep making it happen because it certainly is vital uh, for our future. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's such an important issue. I commend you for continuing to focus on education. All right, then. We surely appreciate it, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. All right, folks, uh, when we come back, sh a quick break. <laughs> Y'all, crazy as white people segment is a trip. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, it's amazing when your ass start lying, but then you got to go to court. Ooh, this is about to be good. We'll be back in a moment. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and on the next Get Wealthy, you'll meet Jandy Turner, who took her love of sports expanded her network and created a thriving business. I settled on developing a golf event planning business, which in and of itself has been very uh, viable for me. One of the things that I've learned from producing hundreds, if not thousands of golf tournaments is that business gets done on the golf course. All on the next Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. What's up, what's up? I'm Dr. Ricky Dillard, the choir master. Hey, yo, peace, world. What's going on? It's the love king of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. No charcoal girls are allowed. I'm white. I got you, bro. Illegally selling water without a permit? On my property. Whoa! Hey! Hey, remember, give me your You don't live here. I'm uncomfortable. Oh, man. So a group of voters in Georgia are suing Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, saying that her involvement in the January 6th insurrection, uh, she should get kicked off the ballot as a result. So it took her to court. Well, today she took the stand. And see, when you are a liar, Matt, it ain't never good to try to lie on the witness stand, especially when they bust your ass with the evidence. So this actually happened today in court. Ms. Green, you've had your disagreements with Speaker Pelosi. Isn't that right? I'm not sure what you mean. You've had political disagreements with her. You don't agree with some of the things she's done in her career, right? Politically speaking, that would be correct. Right. You don't agree with a lot of things she's done, right? Politically speaking, that would be correct. In fact, you think that Speaker Pelosi is a traitor to the country, right? Uh, you're, I'm not answering that question. It's speculation. It's you, you've, you've said that, haven't you, Ms. Green, that she's a traitor to the country? No, I haven't said that. Okay. Put up Plaintiff's Exhibit 5, please. Oh, no, wait. Hold on now. I believe by not upholding the, uh, securing the border, that that mm. violates her oath of office. Fair enough. I'm, I'm not interested in her oath of office. I'm interested in that you said that she's a traitor to our country, right? I, I object, Your Honor. She is not. This is... I, I don't say the relevance. Oh. So then what happened was they actually played the video where it was like, uh, here, here it is. Here it is. This is what she said. Uh, and then 
uh, they, she, they also uh, asked her about uh, liking a particular comment question. on Facebook as it related to whether or not Nancy Pelosi should be shot. Well, check this out. And you're using a CNN article. I'm asking you to comments. answer my question. Did you like a post that said it's quicker, that a bullet to the head would be a quicker way to remove Nancy Pelosi from the role of speaker? I have had many people manage my social media account over the years. I have no idea who liked that. Okay. You're, are you testifying under oath it wasn't you? just want to be clear on that. I am testifying. I have no idea who liked that comment. Fair enough. It could have been you. And you're using a CNN article. I'm asking you to answer my that question. That was funny, Michael. All throughout today, uh, it was, I don't remember, I can't mm -hmm. recall, uh, all kind of stuff. Uh, it, here's when the issue of uh, peaceful protest uh, came up. Uh, watch this. And in your tweet, you mentioned earlier that um, your words, join hashtag March for Trump in D.C. on January 6th to fight for Trump, that you were urging people to come to Washington for a peaceful demonstration, right? Peaceful demonstration, right. absolutely. That, yeah, that word peaceful is nowhere in this tweet, right? Have a look. That word peaceful is I not in this tweet. I can't read it. There's only half of it there. Let's, let's get, give the representative a paper copy of that one. I want to make sure I'm no, not I missing. can see it now. It was scrolled up just a second ago. Okay. Pe peaceful's not in there, is it? Um, well, you know, like... Is the word peaceful in there, Miss Green? It does not say peaceful That's right That's my there. question. But Thank you. But you're asking me, and I said, for peaceful demonstration, just like people have the right to do in their First Amendment. I, I'm asking... You didn't, there's not a secret code in there that's supposed to be peaceful, right? Well, I never mean anything for violence. I don't support violence of any kind, and I've said it over and over again. So I, I'm telling you... You just didn't say it on this occasion, did you? I never mean anything for violence. Every, all of my words never, ever mean anything for violence. We'll, we'll examine that question. Go to I mean, it was question after question. Matt, this woman is a straight-ass liar. Mm -hmm. Straight up liar. And in Georgia, you can get up to 10 years for lying on the stand and up to a thousand dollar fine. So, I mean, she opened herself to, to perjury charges, which is extraordinary, particularly because the really important context of this testimony is that it comes in light of some of her own citizens challenging her ability to seek office because of her involvement or, I guess, support of the January 6th insurrection. So, it seems like this would be the time where if you're facing your challengers, you would realize that the writing's right there. You got the receipts. Go ahead and admit it. Um, but as you see, she's trying to spin, as we know, Republicans like McCarthy did and others have done. <clears throat> I, I, I got to play one more, Michael. I got to play one okay. more. Okay. Watch this. Now, you actually talked publicly about the Declaration of Independence calling for the overthrow of Iran. Right? That's something you are you referencing to something I've said somewhere? Well, do you recall talking about that topic? I've talked about the Declaration of Independence, but I don't know what occasion you're referring to. Okay. Um, well, one of the occasions where you talked about the Declaration of Independence was in connection with January 6th, right? I don't know. Okay. Let's go to um, plaintiff's 15, please. Which one was just Which one is this one, Mr. Chubb? Plaintiff's 15. P15. Yes. Hang on a second. short clip and ask if that's you speaking on the, on the video. Okay. What, what, what's the date on this? I can't read it from here.
You can play the first please. The riot at the Capitol. And if you think about what our Declaration of Independence says, it says to overthrow tyrants. That's your statement, right? I don't believe it was finished, but that was me. I don't, I don't recall. I don't know what the rest of what I was saying. I don't recall. I can't remember. I mean, it was just like, busting a lie, busting a lie, busting a lie. I felt hilarious, Michael. Today and uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene makes dumb blondes look like road scholars. Number one, this is how stupid this <laughs> is. Two, 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 this is dangerous because she's a sitting member in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. Now, the case is based upon uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, 1868, which was put in uh, during the Reconstruction era and it was targeting those uh, members of the Confederacy. And it bars anybody who uh, participates in a rebellion against the country or insurrection from holding uh, elected office, federal office, things like this. So um, hopefully they're successful with this. Now, now this this has never been uh, tested in court. This is the other thing. OK, this this section of the U.S. Constitution has never been tested in court to keep somebody from uh, holding public office. But if they, if they are successful, there's a lot of these domestic terrorists, insurrectionists that they need to go after as well, which is another reason why these Republicans have to be defeated in the 2022 midterm elections and in 2024. Kelly, she also said in the witness stand, I did not talk to anybody at the White House about any of the events on January 6th. Ah, except she posted this. <laughs> Just finished with our meetings here at the White House this afternoon. We had a, had a great planning session for our January 6th objection. We aren't going to let this election be stolen by Joe Biden and the Democrats. President Trump won by a landslide. Call your House reps, call your senators from your states. We've got to make sure they're on board, and we already have a lot of people engaged. Okay, stay tuned. Mm. You ain't talked to nobody at the White House, but your dumb ass put a video out at the White on January 5th saying we had a great meeting. Right. Kelly, I, I, I'm telling you, she just a barrel of laughs. I wish I had the confidence of a mediocre white woman such as Marjorie Taylor Greene. I feel like I would go really far in life, even further than I already am, which is, you know, moderate. But I feel like I would I would be moving like mountains at this point if I had that kind of that that kind of hubris. Like it is, it is astonishing to me how you can lie with a straight face as though we do not have receipts. I mean, it's the same thing with Kevin McCarthy, as if you are just so sure that no one is going to find out the truth, that you are willing to put yourself in such a compromising position <laughs> such that you literally cannot be trusted and you run the risk of going to jail because you lied on the stand. It is just... I, I just wish I had the, the, the gall and the, the, the gumption. <laughs> Of it's a mediocre white person. It is absolutely it, it is, it, hilarious. It's, wonderful. it's absolutely hilarious to me. So we got lying Kevin McCarthy. We got lying Marjorie Taylor Greene. Oh, I, oh and I, I forgot. I, I got to go ahead and just show this here. So you remember when that crazy fool Republican, uh, Cawthorn out of North Carolina, Madison Cawthorn, right. A, 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 accused the Republicans of having orgies and he said they said all kind of stuff and man they were just you know um, um, uh, doing all kind of crazy all kind of wild and crazy things and what he was invited to and he was just shocked and appalled and then later he tried to backtrack well Politico just dropped this story uh, while we were on the air uh, here's Madison dressed up in lingerie at a free party <laughs> No! <laughs> this is the dude in the wheelchair, too. He's in a oh wheelchair, also. 
<laughs> he's in a wheelchair as well. Hey, you might as well just roll you your got, ass on off the stage, man. Just resign. You gotta warn. Just you gotta resign. warn us before you do something like that, man. Come on. Hey, hey. Come on, man. I told y'all they just released it. So I mean, I'm just saying. So hey, expose all these traitors. Expose all of them. Got pictures. Expose all of them. I'm I, all for it. I'm just saying. Tell that again, man. I'm all for it. I'm just saying these are domestic terrorists. We have to understand this inflection point that we're at in history. This is a continuation of the Civil War and and the continuation of the of, of the Compromise of 1877, which ends Reconstruction. So and then go back to the story about Florida. Florida was the first state to have poll taxes in 1889. They were the first of the Confederate states to institute poll taxes, destroy, break their political backs, destroy all of them. I, I'm just saying. Yeah. Birds of a feather flock together. They all have pictures. The, the humor comes in the ga in the gaslighting too, because what they do is they say you didn't see what you're looking at, <laughs> you, you didn't hear what you heard, you didn't see what is on video. So I mean, that's the hubris to use Kelly's word, which I think is the most perfect word. Is this? It's extraordinarily arrogant to assume that people are just going to overlook what they're looking at, and that's what Republicans keep continue to do. I think trying to leverage this idea that you know, everything is a liberal conspiracy or what have you. Like, nah, you said it. But th this is at the same time where they're trying to target pedophiles with the fake QAnon conspiracy theory. And then these domestic terrorists went after Jessica Tanji Brown Jackson uh, because she was the one who con who convicted the uh, the shooter who shot up the Comet Pizza uh, place in Washington, D.C. in 2017. She sentenced him to four years in prison. And he was tracking down this internet conspiracy theory about child, uh, about uh, uh, child, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, children being kept in the basement of the pizzeria and molestation of children, things like this, Hillary Clinton, all this stuff. All this stuff is connected together. De break their political backs. Got a comment, Kelly? I could have gone my whole life without seeing that. My whole life. <laughs> I rip, I don't kink shame. I, love is love. All of that. But I could have gone my entire life. That needed to come with the trigger warning, Roland. I don't. Hey, that I, was, I mean. That was mean. That was mean. Um, <laughs> but the hypocrisy of it all is is what's getting to me. Because we we're coming. We're looking at the legislation in Florida about the don't say gay. We're looking at, you know, Republicans attacking critical race theory that's not even in schools in the first place. We're looking at the mm -hmm. Supreme Court that is, you know, gearing itself to strip away the rights of the LGBTQ plus community. And then you have a differently abled man in semi-drag? Enjoying his life as if you are not part of the party that is trying to take the party away from you. I just want to show y'all. To... I just want to share That's... it with y'all. I just want to share it with y'all. All right, y'all. Uh, we're going to end on that note. Uh, really? <laughs> Kelly, Matt, Michael, I appreciate it. Y'all, I hit the Dallas tomorrow, uh, celebrate my dad. <laughs> Uh, his 75th birthday was actually on Monday, but I'll be uh, there uh, on uh, tomorrow. So uh, looking forward to that. C come on, come on, show. Thank you, thank you. So we'll be there tomorrow. Oh, so his 75th birthday is on Monday. Looking forward to it. Monday, I'll be broadcasting from Las Vegas. I'll be attending the National Association of Broadcasters Convention. Uh, so I'll be there Monday, Tuesday, then off to L.A., Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Next Friday is the 30th anniversary of the Rodney King riots. So we'll be broadcasting from near the scene where... Uh, things happen there in L.A. So a lot of things are happening, folks. And we appreciate all the support that you have for us. Download our Black Star Network app, uh, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Roku TV, uh, Amazon Fire, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And, of course, join our Brina Funk fan club where every dollar you give goes to support this show. Uh, P.O. Box, send your checks and money orders. P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037. That's 0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Now, of course, we always end the show on Fridays showing all of our fan club members. Don't forget the eighth installment 
of our Ghana 16, 19, 2019 series uh, is airing right after this show, so you don't want to miss that. You two, while y'all tripping, we should be at 1,000 likes by now. I don't understand, okay? Y'all sitting here so for the last two hours, messing around, more than 2,000 folks on, and why are we sitting at 783? So, but, uh, look, I ain't getting off till y'all get to 1,000, so let's go. We got 237 to get to. Is 1,600 y'all watching? Hit the damn like button. We should be doing a thousand likes every single day. Why do I have to ask y'all to hit the like button? That's all I'm saying. Hit the like button. Come on. Let's hit a thousand before we get off of here. Facebook, you should be hitting the share button as well. Now we're at 873. Let's go. All we need is another uh, 100 uh, and uh, 27. So let's go, y'all. You don't like. I don't need to be asking y'all. So that's right. Hit the like button so we can get on out of here. All right. I gotta go pack. Don't make no, 900, come on, 953, 47 more, let's go. I should have be asking y'all, it should just be uh, just natural, you hit the like button as soon as you log on, okay? And in fact, we had more than 2,000 folks watching, we should have 2,000 likes, uh, we've got a few haters, but I'll go ahead and accept that. Finally, we hit 1,000 likes, so go full screen with the, with the fan club members. I gotta go, I'll see y'all on Monday. Holla!